How you doing? Good to have you on Baden Hill with me again. Now we're going to look at our neighbor to the south. And this neighbor honestly is often underestimated and understudied. One reason for this in schools in the United States has to do with the fact that in the past, and today as well, there has been a lot of prejudice against a group of people who have a different language from us, who have uh, many different cultural ways from uh, what has been seen as mainstream United States culture or language. And the unfortunate thing is that many Americans have seen our southern neighbor who has supported us in so many ways. They've seen Mexico as a sort of threat to the United States. And this goes all the way back to the beginning of our country and even into colonial times. We need to take a look at Mexico and it has a complicated history and a complicated geography. So we're going to look first at the treasures of Mexico. And this is, again, something that has led many Americans south in order to take away Mexico's treasures. And this began with Manifest Destiny and President Polk wanting the southwest of what is now the United States, wanting to take that land away from Mexico. And it's really a black mark on the history of the United States. The, the idea that because the United States was powerful, they could take away such an important uh, possession of another country. We cry out in our country when that happens today. And so we need to look at ourselves honestly, and obviously we can't go back and, and uh, make bad things go away. We can't go in a time machine, but we can think about it as a reason that the relationship between the United States and Mexico has been one of distrust. So compare that to the relationship with Canada. Even though we invaded Canada, we still have a close relationship in it. And a lot of it has to do with a shared language and a shared culture. So let's talk about what makes Mexico. First of all, Mexico has um, two mountain ranges and they're really kind of two offshoots of the same mountain range. And these are called the Sierra Madre. It means the mother mountains or the mountains of the mother. And it, it could refer to uh, the Virgin Mary because Mexico, from the, the influence of Spain, a Catholic country, has maintained a very Catholic culture. Another reason that many in the United States who have been generally Protestant have felt like they are different and divided from people in Mexico. So where do these Sierra Madre mountains come from? Uh, well, first of all, you need to know that it comes all the way down the coast, all the way from uh, the Arctic, from Alaska in the mountains that, that we've already talked about, uh, Mount Logan and, and Mount, what is uh, Mount Denali today, uh, it used to be Mount McKinley. So that mountain range goes all the way through Washington and Oregon. And, and in California, we have the Sierra Nevada, the Sierra Nevada mountains. And then it continues into Mexico, splits off into two mountain chains. All of that is called the American Cordillera. Uh, it means basically the, the backbone of the continent. And... Uh, in Mexico, those two mountain ranges that split apart, both called Sierra, Sierra Madre, they are the, uh, the Occidental, which is the Western Sierra Madre, and the Oriental. So Occidental and Oriental, Western and Eastern. I think I just flipped it around on my camera, so I'm gonna say that again. So it's the Occidental, which is the Western, and the Oriental. I gotta remember that when my video shows up for you, it's gonna be reversed. Forgive me for that. 
So there are two mountain ranges that provide kind of the framework for Mexico. And as a result, you have uh, precipitation in those areas and you have certain climates and vegetation. But you also, because of those mountains, you have deserts. You have uh, the Sonoran Desert, you have the, uh, 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 well, there's the Mojave Desert in California. So the, the bottom line is you have deserts because the precipitation is withheld from those areas. But, uh, you know, water makes the world go round. It really does. Let's talk about the treasure of the Sierra Madre which actually is the name of a novel which became a famous movie in 1948. If you've ever heard of uh, a movie star named Humphrey Bogart, he's very old school and uh, his famous line is, here's looking at you kid, or uh, he, he says sweetheart, sweetheart a lot. And he's a very famous movie star from the 1940s and 50s and even into the 1960s. And he was uh, in a movie called The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. And it's about three guys who go looking for gold. They find a treasure and then they betray one another. Okay, so that's what the story of the movie is about. But the treasure of the Sierra Madre is Mexico's resources, enormous resources. And it starts with silver. Silver became a massive industry for first for the Spanish colonies, you know, that they also mined gold, but eventually it was silver that made Mexico uh, into a nation and gave them uh, the means to modernize and industrialize. It was all about silver and for decades and even centuries, that silver was being mined and taken out of the country, either by Spain or by the United States, uh, by some other country. Mexico, like other countries around the world, was developed by a foreign power. Uh, and so silver is something you need to know is very key to Mexico's history and development. But so is oil. Mexico is an oil rich nation and particularly in the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, there's a lot of oil and there's a lot of wealth to be had. Unfortunately, that wealth is not evenly distributed. What about native Mexicans? We talk about native Americans and we know that America shouldn't just mean the United States, but it generally does. And we have native Canadians. What about native Mexicans? Well, when Spanish explorers came into what is now Mexico, they annihilated many native groups and uh, partly because of the diseases they brought, but also because they practiced slavery from Columbus forward, they made native Mexicans into slaves. And there was a massive gap between those who had wealth and money and power and those who had nothing who were essentially slaves. Uh, and that gap has been one of the main reasons Mexico has been slow to become more modern, more stable. And it's something that we all need to pay attention to. Uh, if we want to have a safe country here in the United States, we also need to support stability and safety in other countries that are our neighbors. And with Canada, we haven't had to worry about that. But with Mexico, the conditions because of extreme poverty and government unrest and corruption, those things have created a situation where there is a massive drug economy in Mexico. I won't really touch on that, but you need to know it goes back to the beginning of Mexico's history. The fact that there is all this money and that money is often in the hands of a few and uh, because of the poverty that people have they want to they want to rise up and they do it often using illegal means and violence uh so that is the the story of the treasure of the sierra madre
let's focus on specific locations within Mexico. Mexico City is the heart of Mexico. It's geographically in close to the center. And it was uh, traditionally, back to the times of the Spanish conquerors, it was the center then as well. And it was first the kind of the center for the group called the Olmecs. Uh, and the Olmecs created many temples, temple mounds, and also these colossal heads. So they were a group that, that emerged around 2000 BC and lasted until about 1500, eh, a, a little later. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to extend that. Lasted until into AD. So really almost 2000 years of Olmecs controlling areas in Mexico and around Mexico City. But then the Aztecs became the conquerors and they were a migrant people and then they settled in the the, the place where they saw a sign that they thought was from the gods. It was an eagle eating a serpent on a cactus and it's a part of their national flag. If you look at the flag of Mexico, you see the picture of the eagle eating the snake on a cactus. And uh, so that was the location that the Aztecs knew they had to build their capital. And the only problem was it was in the middle of a lake. So there was an island, but there wasn't much you could build on. And so the Aztecs created what became their capital called Tenochtitlan. Tenochtitlan uh, was using that island in the middle of Lake uh, Texcoco. Texcoco is the way you say that. The X is actually an SH sound. So Lake Texcoco uh, was where the Aztecs built Tenochtitlan in the middle of the lake. And then what they did is they built more artificial land and they basically reclaimed land from the lake and they drained areas so that they could build a bigger city. Uh, so Mexico City, then after the Spanish conquerors came in, they conquered Tenochtitlan and they built their own city right on top of Tenochtitlan and they called it Mexico City. And it was a way for them to establish power just like the Aztecs had. So, you know, the Aztecs were conquerors and they were pretty bloodthirsty and so were the Spanish. When Mexico City was established, it was it was very marshy, right? First of all, it had been a lake and they drained that, but it was very marshy. And so the land uh, was susceptible to sinking and also flooding. And so they had a lot of engineering to do to make the city last. And there were there were times where the city was flooded for five years because of this problem. And people wondered, should we build in another place? It's a little bit like what happened after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. People wondered if New Orleans would ever be rebuilt. And they thought maybe they should just rebuild it in a more protected location. But it didn't happen that way. New Orleans is rebuilt in the same location. The same thing with Mexico City. So part of the problem is the marshlands that it's built on. Uh, another problem is that it's actually below the water table. So even though they drain out the water, when it rains, it kind of comes down and the water table level is actually higher than the city. And so you're constantly having uh, water seeping up and more flooding. But weirdly, because of all of the engineering they've done to get rid of this water problem, now they have a different water problem. They have water shortage. And nevertheless, people continue to live in Mexico City uh, by the millions. In fact, there are about 8 million people in the city of, in, in the actual city, and it's, you know, not a very big area, but there's a sprawling metropolitan area that's 21 million people, and that's about a fifth of the total population of Mexico. And the population has been exploding in Mexico City and has created a lot of worries because culturally people have wanted large families in Mexico and if you have all those people in the city it's very difficult uh, to help them live uh, good lives and so air pollution is another problem they have there and finally it's an area susceptible to earthquakes not only because they happen but because that marshland 
liquefies when there is an earthquake. It's it's an amazing thing, and and it, it that means the whole city is shaking. This is what happened in 1985 when I was a sophomore in high school. I remember uh, the massive earthquake and uh, the thousands of people who died because these skyscrapers collapsed instantly, and there was no time to get people to safety. It was a horrible, horrible. Um, but there were stories of people being dug out of the rubble, the, the rubble, even weeks after the earthquake. Unbelievable how they could have survived. And finally, you need to know that Mexico City, it's up in the mountains. It's at an altitude of 7,382, 7,382 feet above sea level. So it is this unique place. Uh, the Olympics in 1968 were held there in Mexico City and uh, all kinds of records were set because if you don't know, at high altitude, people can actually jump farther and higher and, and uh, it was very interesting. Uh, I wasn't alive then, but I remember seeing the, the movies of the Olympics there and how, how interesting it was. It's kind of like, you know, Denver being a mile high and hitting home runs there is pretty easy. Let's talk about other cities quickly. Uh, first of all, well, we won't talk about cities quite yet. We'll talk about the other features. We have the Gulf of California on the west coast. It's basically this arm that comes down and you have the, uh, the peninsula sticking down and then you have the Sea of Cortez in between. So it's, it's the Gulf of California. Uh, now let's talk about cities. You, you, as you can imagine, just like at the north of the United States, most of the cities that are uh, huge cities are right across the border from the United States. And so you have a string of cities that match up with U.S. cities. You have Tijuana, which is across from San Diego. Uh, you have uh, Mexicali, Nogales, and you have Juarez, which is right across from El Paso. And uh, these are the border cities. And so when we talk about uh, illegal aliens, illegal immigrants, many times those are the locations where people are crossing into the United States. And we'll talk about that a little bit in a second. Other cities in Mexico, Guadalajara, Monterrey, and Hermosillo, those are three very large cities. And then you have coastal cities on both coasts. You have uh, Mazatlan and Acapulco and Puerto Vallarta and Veracruz. Those are cities that have had uh, a lot of tourism because of the beautiful coasts, but there's still extreme poverty in those cities. And everybody that I know who has gone to those coastal resort areas, they kind of close off the resort. And then there are so many people who are in need for uh, children and they are looking to the tourists to to give them some sustenance and it's, it's it's very troubling when you realize that this is happening so close to our own country and uh, finally you know you should know that the river that separates the United States from Mexico is called the the Rio Grande in English and the Rio Grande the big river uh, that's the border between Texas and Mexico Let's talk a little bit more about the indigenous peoples of Mexico. And so indigenous means that they are of a type that is from the country, that they live in the country, that they have always come from there. In terms of human history, that's what they remember. So we've talked a little bit about the Olmecs and the fact that they were kind of the first civilization back in the thousands BC. Uh, you have the Mayans who were in the Yucatan Peninsula, we'll talk about them. And they they were around from, you know, uh, 500 BC all the way to 1000 AD, and then they disappeared. And it's a mystery as to why they disappeared. You have the Aztecs who were thriving in, you know, the, the 1300s, 1400s AD, and then 1500, 1519, 
When Cortes came from Spain, he was able to conquer the Aztecs with just a, a hundred men, hundred soldiers, because of the diseases, the smallpox that they brought, and also their weapons, their guns, and because he tricked them into trusting them. They thought he was a god come down from heaven. And uh, then you have, you know, the you need to know Nahuatl. Nahuatl is the language of the Aztecs, and, and it's the language that, that unites a lot of those indigenous peoples. And so any name in Mexico that has the X, which is the SH sound, like Texcoco, that is from the Nahuatl language. And uh, Native Americans, Native Mexicans, or the indigenous peoples, they actually, they, they did rise up uh, periodically. In fact, from the time of Cortes on, you have an uprising called the, ya the Yaqui Wars. And the ya Yaqui Wars were uh, fought from 1520 till 1920. And so it's 400 years of uh, native Mexicans saying, we will not be controlled. And even after there was a revolution in, in the early 1800s and Mexico uh, had a president who said, okay, we're gonna make the native Mexicans citizens, but we're also going to tax them. That was actually what brought the, uh, the Yaquis into war again, because they didn't wanna be taxed. They had never been taxed and now they were being taxed. And so there's been conflict between the indigenous peoples and these foreign or incoming cultures. In fact, in the 1990s, they're in Chiapas, which is one of the southernmost provinces or states, I should say, the southernmost state of Mexico. In Chiapas, there was a conflict between these indigenous uh, related uh, peoples they, they saw that their ancestors were indigenous peoples, even if sometimes they were mixed ancestry. And they, they rose up because their culture was being threatened and they were farmers largely. And, and so uh, that conflict is still going on today. And they have officially declared war on the, on the Mexican state. And so there's a lot of unrest even in Mexico today. Let's talk just last about the Yucatan Peninsula, which is kind of the thumb that sticks out uh, from Mexico, uh, you know, in into the Gulf of Mexico. It separates uh, the Gulf of Mexico from the Caribbean Sea. And it's uh, traditionally, it was the home of the Mayas. And so there are many temples and cities located there, uh, Tikal and Chichen Itza. Uh, these are famous uh, locations where you can go today. They Initially, they were buried by the jungle, but they were discovered. And remember, the Mayans had, dis had just disappeared, and we don't know why they did. Uh, so Cortes came to that peninsula. He landed at Veracruz, but then he went to the Yucatan Peninsula. He asked them, what, what is this place called? And he got a word back, Yucatan. And it turns out that that very likely meant, I don't know what you're saying. So the name Yucatan Peninsula very likely means, I don't know what you're saying to me. I don't understand your question. So that's kind of comedy for, uh, you know, lovers of geography. And one major city in the Yucatan Peninsula today is Cancun. And you know that that is a famous tourist destination again. And you have both extremes. You have this beautiful paradise, but you also have this poverty, uh, a hellish poverty that people have to live through. So. That's a little geography, but it's also culture in its society. And we need to pay attention because when people to ourselves are so poor that they become desperate and they have uh, conflicts with other people or they, they must flee violence, they're going to come to a place that seems like it's worth it to come to, even if they are put in prison. Uh, so we need to remember that and we need to try to understand other people's lives and walk in their shoes.